yes, so I've I've been I've been frustrated by my colleagues who um, who won't admit their drug use, uh, even you know the ones that are s that are now sneaking cigars and cigarettes behind the bike sheds. Um, that's what happens at Parliament these days. Uh, they go and smoke behind the bike bike sheds. But I um, I'm just going to try and can I see if I, can I put this light somewhere where I can see my. No I just kind of sorry, guys. But yeah, this is to me. Oh, fantastic! This has been my year of um, death and drugs, uh, or sex, death and drugs, is um, the way I'd like to coin it. I've um, I've been doing a, a lot of work and a lot of travel on end of life choices and on voluntary euthanasia, and it's remarkable. And, and I don't know why, and, and maybe I'll get to speak to Dana afterwards, but um, wherever there is sensible law, laws around dying with dignity, there seems to be sensible drug laws. So that's, I, in my last trip, I went to Portugal, um, Oregon, Switzerland, and, and, and Canada, and, and all of them with progressive laws on dying with dignity, but also with progressive, progressive and progressing uh, laws on drugs. So I've um, managed to do two trips like that where I've been looking at the good and the bad and, um, and quite often the mad, but it's generally when I get back to Australia that I see the really mad laws that we have around, have around drugs. And, um, and Victoria, where I am, is not, um, is not different. So as, as you do, I was looking back at my 12 months, as you do, you Google yourself, which um, I'm sure we've all done. Uh, I Googled myself or I, I hand, I, I know that you can hand yourself, I'm not sure whether it's a verb, but I, I hand myself and, um, and I, I hand myself for drugs and I found that I'd, I'd mentioned drugs 517 times in 64 documents. Uh, we meet for about, um, we meet two weeks out of every four for 10 months of the year. So uh, I'm obviously talking about drugs quite a lot. Um, when I talked about cannabis, I searched myself for cannabis, I mentioned that 206 times. Um, so it looks like I've been speaking about it every, every week. In fact, my maiden inaugural speech was when I first started talking about cannabis and drugs and drug law reform. And I seem to not have stopped doing it. Um, so I get to ask questions. In, in Parliament and I get to give statements and I also get to speak on legislation, which I'll speak about in a few minutes. But a, pol a, a parliamentarian like me, who's an independent in there, I'm the only one, uh, my vote is sometimes important, so I tend to be constantly trying to work out whether people really are being nice to me or just um, being politically nice to me. More often than not, it's the latter. But I get to ask questions on notice of the ministers and they must answer, uh, must answer me within 30 days. I get to ask questions without notice, one every week, uh, of which they must answer me immediately. Uh, I get to ask a constituency question where I, I have a constituent ask me about why can't they buy a bong in their um, Sydney Road bong shop, um, all questions like that. And I get to ask one of those a week. And I get to speak about, I get three minutes to talk about whatever I like, you know, how my summer holidays were, etc. kind of an adjournment speech. Um, so that's, those are the topics that I cover. So I've covered pill testing trials numerous times, um, sniffer dogs many times, and I know we'll hear from David Shoebridge on the work, the amazing work that he's been doing in New South Wales on this, uh, road testing and impairment and THC levels. Uh, I got to meet the friendly police as we were coming in, as well as, um, is it Channel 7 that's doing the um, Rhodes RBT, pro very popular program? Uh, I got to talk about wa water pipes. I even, get, even got to talk about Bicycle Day and about the medicinal effects of LSD, uh, much to kind of confused faces around the room. Um, I get to speak about 420. And last year I also spoke about Mardi Gras. So Mardi Gras is officially in the Victorian Hansard. So well done you. Um, now I can't say that I've been getting fantastic responses to these questions. They're not saying, oh shit, you're absolutely right, Fiona. LSD does have some medicinal effects and we should allow that. Or yeah, pill testing, what a great idea. All right, we're on to it. Thank you. Good on you. 
no, we're not getting that. I'm kind of getting drugs are bad, shut up. Um, in the nicest possible way that they say this to me. Um, they also say things like, you know, Fiona, we can't arrest our way out of, a, out of the ice epidemic. We can't arrest our way out of um, the drug problems that we've got in this state. Um, I think even now our former Prime Minister, which I don't know how many back he was, but yeah, uh, Mr Abbott uh, said, um, it seems so long ago, doesn't it? Uh, he said, um, look, I think the um, war on drugs actually isn't working, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying. Um, he, <laughs> I guess he's a trier. Um, he's certainly trying. Uh, so in Victoria, we have our police minister, we have our attorney general, we have all sorts of very sensible uh, ministers telling me and telling us that the, uh, that we can't stop the harm of drug on drugs by arresting our way out of it. So I got to witness how they approached this and um, this was the Drug Misuses Amendment Bill, which was in the press release, we can't arrest our way out of the ice scourge, pandemic, epidemic, um, whatever other hideous war laws, words they can use. So we're going to increase the penalties for trafficking all drugs. Um, we're also kind of rest our way out of this issue, but arrests are 20% up in Victoria. Uh, we've now got a position where we've banned the, um, banned the possession of, uh, of instructions for trafficking, cultivating, uh, possession of, in, of instructions for trafficking or cultivating drugs without a reasonable excuse. I'm not sure we were never able to work out what a reasonable excuse was, but if you don't have one, you can get five years jail. Uh, so apparently, because it's funny, I read in a thing that I'd seen on, on the internet about how to grow magic mushrooms in your school locker. Now, I thought that was very funny, but in fact, it's actually illegal in Victoria. And if I had, tr if I had also published that on my Facebook page, uh, it would have been 10 years jail. Uh, I am guilty of having a very nice collection of the old High Times magazines. Uh, I'm not sure that I should turn myself in, but I've certainly ha read some of it into Hansard. So we're st uh, sadly, even though um, we, we are recognising that the war on drugs is failing, we are failing to do anything about it. Uh, having said that, one of the, um, the areas that Victoria has taken a very timid approach is on medicinal cannabis. Uh, are, is everyone here aware that uh, Victoria introduced medical cannabis legislation? Yeah. Anyway, they did. Uh, but they said, look, medicinal cannabis, cannabis can treat, as we all know, many ailments. And the, the Victorian Law Reform Commission did a very... Um, uh, conservative but considered report on medicinal cannabis and, and how it should be made available. The Victorian government said spot on, we will adopt all of those rec recommendations and then they didn't. Uh, so we got medicinal cannabis for uh, children suffering from severe forms of epilepsy. Now that's fantastic and that should have been available years and years and years ago for those kids and I know a lot of the parents who have been uh, facing incredible uh, jail sentence or other forms of sanctions, losing children to, to human services uh, because they've been providing um, uh, cannabis uh, medications for their very sick children. So it's a wonderful thing that we are seeing a legal avenue for them, but they will not allow it for anybody else. So they're not allowing it for adults with severe epilepsy. They're not allowing it for terminally ill cancer patients who are suffering severe nausea. Um, these were all the very, I considered very conservative recommendations. I put up an amendment to say, hang on a second, if you're going to let it through for, for children with epilepsy, you're going to set up this whole system. Um, it's going to be sold from pharmacies uh, with doctor's prescriptions of, of doctor's advice of sorts. Uh, why not make it available for adults as well? Why not just this small cohort of children? Unfortunately, I lost that vote 39 to 1. Uh, there was not a single member of parliament who would support the notion of giving terminally ill patients uh, legal access to medicinal cannabis. So while it was one small step, I was um, very sad with where it, it, um, it fell. The 
the one thing that I was very pleased about, and this is what I hope will be somewhat of a legacy and, 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 and enable us to push the debate forward on drug law reform, and not just on harm minimisation, but looking at models that work around drugs, that stop this war on drugs, that recognise that 99% of us who use drugs um, do not need rehab, do not need treatment centres, uh, just don't need to go to jail or be, um, or be arrested and prosecuted for it. So I was successful, remarkably, in getting a, um, a very broad inquiry up. And I will put this up on the Facebook page because it's, it's, it's a very broad inquiry. But the government, and it was um, voted on, so it was, um, it was 21 votes to 19. If I hadn't, um, if it was looking like I was going to lose, remarkably, the National Party actually said, um, they put, one of the guys pulled me over and said, yeah, I've heard about this Portuguese model. It sounds pretty good. Um, and so he was actually going to support me and cross the floor if I hadn't got the numbers to get this inquiry up. So this inquiry will will look at the effectiveness of drug treatment programs um, and, and look at the where, where our harm minimisation strategies are working. And in fact, when we do harm minimise strat strategies, they, don't, they do work, we just don't do them very often. Uh, but looking at where, where else there, there are good harm minimisation strategies. Uh, reviewing the effectiveness of our investment into policing illicit drugs. So let's look at the millions and millions of dollars that we're spending on um, prosecuting and persecuting uh, drug users and see how effective that is. Is that reducing the number of people using drugs? Is that reducing the number of any drug-related harm as they can identify? Um, Reviewing the effectiveness of drug detection programs, in, including roadside testing and procedures for deploy, deploying drug detection activities at, at music events. Um, ass assessing the impact of prescription medication on road safety. So I was speaking to a friend earlier who um, you know, is worried about using cannabis uh, for their pain because of driving but not worried about using endone or any morphine or opiate-related prescription drugs um, for their pain, even though that would severely impair their driving. Uh, they know that and they don't do it. Um, and the other major part of this inquiry will be assess assessing practices of other Australian states and territories and overseas jurisdictions and their approach to drug law reform and how positive reforms can be um, introduced into Victorian law. And that is where we're up to at the moment. The committee, which is a very conservative committee, it has a couple of extra, um, sorry, a couple of former police officers who are now country members of parliament. Uh, it's a very conservative group, but I think that that is actually a very good group to start with. So to work with a conservative group that, and the police officers are probably the best on that group, that they recognise that what they were doing out there in the field wasn't working. That, um, that they needed to find a new approach. And I, I think you'll find that, you know, when you speak to ex-police officers, so many of them, so many of them say that. Um, so with this inquiry, we, at the beginning, we now have, uh, we're now producing an issues and discussion paper. So this will look at the sorts of things that we think the committee could inquire into. So it will be looking at some of the laws around the other countries. Uh, it will be looking at some of the uh, innovations uh, like needle, um, safe injecting rooms in New South Wales. It will be looking at things like Switzerland, which has uh, a legal heroin program. Uh, and then, of course, it will be looking at states like California that are just moving to legalise um, cannabis and, and obviously looking closely at, at Canada and where they're, they're going there, Amsterdam, etc., and looking at the other countries of where there is progressive law reform. An issues paper will be developed and then we will ask people to put submissions in. Now, I've been on the um, End of Life Choices Committee. It was another inquiry that I started and we had 1,100 submissions. Most of them were personal stories and they were so powerful. It was so important to hear those personal stories because, you know, 
an, an awful lot of us feel very nervous about saying, I smoke pot or I, I, I take drugs. Uh, we feel nervous that we might lose our jobs. Um, we feel nervous for all sorts of reasons. Uh, so we don't, we don't talk about it. So this inquiry is going to give us the opportunity to talk about that, to tell the stories, to talk about the... Um, oh. Oh, so, I, I thought that was my bouquet. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it, sadly, the um, the industrial hemp plant has to go home because yeah. oh, it's against it's, the rules for it to be away from home, right? Right. Oh, past so, its sorry, time. Fiona, for interrupting oh, your right, talk. Um, bye. <laughs> uh, but this is this is an opportunity. Eleven eleven hundred submissions on end of life care and people telling their stories about. Um, their end of life experiences with their, he doesn't want to go, <laughs> uh, their end of life experiences and the pain and suffering that they had loved ones went through or they themselves um, are going through. It was very powerful stuff and I think when our report comes down uh, next month it will make some very uh, progressive uh, recommendations that will be in line with what the community told us. Now this is what the community needs to tell us now. They need to talk about uh, th the positive effects of drug use. Yes, the negative effects, but all we generally hear about are the negative effects of drug use. Let's start talking about the positive ones. Let's hear about people who have successful lives and yet still enjoy relaxing with their drug of choice that may not be alcohol or nicotine. Let's hear those stories. And this is what I'm really hoping that will come out of this inquiry is that we not only do we investigate what other jurisdictions are doing, but we also hear from the community about their lives and about the, the, the real face of, of drug use, which is all of us in this room. We are the face of drug use. It's not that, you know, scab, scratching person that we see on the don't use drugs kids uh, commercials. It's, it's not the sloth that we see on those particularly pathetic um, anti-drug use campaigns that went out of New South Wales Health Department. It is, this, it is this room and this is so important. I think it was what Dana was saying. We need to be out and proud. We need to talk about this whether it's civil disobedience, and I was at 4.20 the other day and, you know, I was really, you know, impressed with it until I heard Dana speak about what goes on in Vancouver with their 100,000 people in their farmer's market. But we had nearly 6,000 people in Flagstaff Gardens in, in Melbourne. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, Matt Riley, I don't know if he's here today, but he, he kind of put it out there and it was a beautiful day. There was a lot of illegal water pipes out there. There was a lot of really lovely people having a really lovely time. There was not a police officer to be seen, uh, which was uh, we were very pleased about. And, and when you've got five or 6,000 people in one area, that's actually very unusual. But we got, yeah, there was nearly 6,000 people there. It was a fantastic show of uh, support for cannabis law reform. And we need to do more of this. And, and with committee inquiries like this, this is our ability to be really putting that out. And, and on an optimistic end, I mean, I, I do feel like we're coming to a tipping point. When we're seeing Canada about to, to legislate on recreational cannabis, when we're seeing California start to, to legislate. I've recently been in, um, in Portland where uh, I got to, um, you know, try some of the local goods and speak to locals about uh, the legislation there where recreational cannabis is available. Speak to the taxi drivers, speak to the Uber drivers, speak to, to anyone that would talk drugs with me, um, would talk on drugs with me. Uh, well, I was on drugs, I think they were driving. Uh, but um, all of them were like, eh, well, you know, it's there. You can get it. Um, the world didn't fall in. The, you know, they didn't see cr crime rates you know, escalate. They didn't see people driving cars into trees. Uh, they didn't see this type of thing. And, um, and, and nor, quite nicely, did they expect to see that, unlike here. And I think this is, we've got to get this message out. And, and Mardi Gras is, is a great way of doing it in showing... Um, that there, there are better models, that there are great e examples. And if I, can, um, if I can leave it with just saying, please watch our website, watch the Sex Party's website 
for this because I really encourage everyone to make submissions. If I could get 1,100 submissions to this, this would, ch this would help change the law. This would definitely help change the law. And, you know, on a final note, obviously we've got a federal election coming up. Uh, so think carefully about how you place your six numbers in the Senate. Um, and please support parties that support um, drug law reform. Awesome. Thank you. And I've got a few spares of these. Yeah, we've got some questions. Hello. Hi. Thank you. That was great. Um, just, you just mentioned about the event in Melbourne and you said there wasn't any police or you couldn't see any. And I just wonder if you can reflect about why that would be when today out there on the street the place is crawling with police. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's, it, is, it is an interesting contrast. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes I kind of... I, I wonder whether New South Wales and Victoria are, are moving further and further apart. Um, your, your, your sniffer dog programs... It, the pro sniffer dog programs in New South Wales are, uh, you know, just uh, just um, huge compared to any progr similar programs that we have in Victoria. I I I do speak to the police a lot in Victoria. Um, I I do wonder whether they they are taking a slightly different approach to the approach of New South Wales police. I think I heard Andrew mention, you know, Commissioner Scipioni. Uh, Commissioner Scipioni has a very different approach to, to, to drug law. Uh, the commissioner, uh, I mean, the former commissioner in Victoria, Ken Lay, uh, has been one of the major proponents for taking a new approach to, to, to reducing the, the harm of drugs. Uh, so I, I just wonder whether there's a different culture in the Victorian police. Hey, Fiona. Hey. How you doing? Um, I was just wondering, you said you were the only vote that voted for expanding medical cannabis to adults with epilepsy. Mm. Does that mean the Greens also voted against it? I'm afraid so. Okay. I'm afraid so. Um, it was very disappointing. The pathetic answer that I got from the government and which the Greens uh, uh, agreed with was that they couldn't supply the medical cannabis um, for, 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 for a larger cohort. I, I said I'd give them some names and numbers um, <laughs> and that I could put them in touch with a few people who would have no trouble in supplying them. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really disappointing. Um, I, I thought that given that it was a Victorian Law Reform Commission um, report, I mean, we, we're not talking about some radical group proposing some radical laws. It was very cautious. It was, it was all going to be... Um, put through uh, doctors and put through pharmacies in this initial instant. Stint. So, yeah, it was, it was disappointing that I couldn't get the green support on it. Yeah, hi, Fiona. Hi. Um, I was just wanting to ask, as a family who would qualify under this new legislation... Yeah, great. Um, ..what is actually going to happen for the 200-odd children who are already using medical cannabis in Victoria who are not going to change? You know, they're estimating 400 kids in Victoria would qualify... But if 200 of them are not going to use it, why mm. aren't they offering it to the older ones? And what <laughs> happens when my 14-year-old turns 18? Yep. You know? I, um, I asked that exact question. So you're going to give it to a 17-year-old with, with um, Dravitz or, or yeah. severe forms, um, but you're not going to give it to them when they turn 18. Yeah. Well, for, uh, for they said, yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Well, for us personally, if anything, we'd buy one bottle to be legal, tip it mm. out and use what we're using now. Yeah, and, I, I and look. I yeah. um, I I I suspect that you will not be alone in this, and I think this is when, and it's the same thing that Dana was touching on that when governments try to work out the most restrictive, cautious, uh, conservative approach to to any form of cannabis law reform, and even in the med medicinal sphere, this is when they come a cropper because people who have been using it successfully and, like yourself, successfully lobbying the government mm. for, for law reform, um, it, it, it actually... They don't go far enough to meet your needs. And that's... I mean, it's just the disappointing part of it. I was calling for an amnesty from now if we're going down this path. In mm. fact, I was calling for an amnesty last year when they announced that they were going to allow medicinal cannabis. I was saying, well, let's have an amnesty right here, right now. And I think there's also... Um, 
you know, you there will be medicinal cannabis that hopefully will be will be as good as the can the product that you're using now, but I, I couldn't be certain. Yeah. I, I'd like to see what they're offering. You know, that's to me, it's been very secretive, and you know, like ninety percent of the kids in this country are using THCA. Uh, yeah. You know, we don't even know. Are they offering CBD? Are they offering THCA? Are that a mixture? What you know, like this is where um, we need politicians like yourself to be able to get these details and get it out to the families that are going to be affected and say, well, look, this is what is on offer. See, and, yeah. next next Tuesday, you are my constituent question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be asked, I will actually ask that question um, of, of the minister next, next week. Hi, Fiona. I just... Hi, I just want to go back to, obviously, medicinal cannabis. Yeah. With it going into, essentially, what seems to be a pharmaceutical model, has anyone actually costed that? And when will we know? <laughs> are these families who are now paying nothing, mm. you know, nothing for a plant that comes out of the ground that has these miraculous results in these kids, are they going to be asked to pay $600 a week? $5,000 a week. I mean, I know of a family in Queensland who are the only ones that I know of that have been able to get access through the TGA and all the million red tape, how yeah. many years, you know, your kid's nearly dead. But now you can have it. <laughs> um, $60,000. Mm. I, I know. Now, and these families get to the point, a lot of them are scared to use medicinal cannabis until their children have nothing left, which means that they're also broke. That's right. Most of them are absolutely desperate because we don't have financial support for most of these families. Epilepsy is not classed as a disability. Um, you know, you can't... I mean, you can't just keep buying medical equipment, paying for drugs, even under the PDS. So then if the government is offering them, oh, here, you can have it now, we don't really know if it's going to work as well and we want $1,000 a week. Yeah. Has anyone costed it? Uh, we, I, I asked those exact questions um, during the committee process. Uh, what they said is that it will be affordable, that it has to work within sort of a, a PBS scheme. So they would not expect parents to be paying um, more than uh, between 2 and $20 um, for, per week for, for the product. How they are going to do that when they're only make, growing it for... for maximum 400 people, I don't know, because the, the scale ratio does not work. Um, had they broadened the, the cohort of people who could access it, we could have obviously made it more, made it more efficient in, in, in the growth, in, in growing in larger quantities. Uh, again, these are, the, the government saying, rest assured, we'll make sure it's, um, uh, make sure it's cheap and available to the families that need it. And I, I think they genuinely, believe that that is the case, but I think we'll now be looking at a government-funded program for those 400 children uh, that were, as, as many of you know, were, many of those children were receiving that product through um, compassionate, uh, compassionate growers and, and really caring people, many of whom are in this room right now. Uh, so the, the government has got a hard act to follow, really. So I don't really understand why the government has to have anything to do with it other than giving the people who are already doing this very successfully the signature that they need to be able to mass produce it because they're not being raided every second day. Why, if they actually care about these kids and health, don't they just go to where it already is? And I know the answer, but it needs to be asked. I, <laughs> good, I'm... <laughs> Um, I love a Dorothy Dixer. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's it's their timidity, their um, their fear of the word cannabis uh, that 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 keeps them taking these tiny steps that that are that are probably not enough to to succeed. So they're tiny steps that will fail, um, and we will all continue to do whatever we can to help to help people who need medicinal cannabis, um, whether it's um, growing it compassionately or, like me, campaigning for, for greater laws that, um, 
that make it available to the widest number of people as possible and grown by the widest number of people as possible. This is when we will see scientific breakthroughs. This is when we will see a much better um, industry and a much better research, research becoming available on this. Uh, but governments are very scared. And to give the Victorian government their due, they are the first state to, to actually put, put legislation through. Uh, as I say, though, it is it is so meek and it is so timid that it, it unfortunately it's not really going to be effective at all. Uh, but yes, but didn't it look lovely on the front pages of the paper? You know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Oh, there's a whole bunch of legislation there, but it's just not going to affect anyone. <laughs> No, and, 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 and I'm not even sure, I mean, we might see it in 2017. 